Who's this? Oh, you're an entrepreneur? Oh, you're a real estate investor. Oh, you're trying to learn from those who did it. Well, come into the lab then. Put your white coat on, gloves on, notepad, and let's build y'all. Real estate experiment, what is happening, y'all? Today, I have a very special guest. Uh, we're so overdue. That's Jerome Myers stepped into the lab with me. First of all, thank you for coming in, man. I've uh, been, you know, connecting on, on social media a lot. I'm like, it's time. It's time to get business. It's, it's time for you to come into the lab and step in. So thank you for making the time today to come in, man. Man, I'm excited to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity to share with your audience. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm going to get right into it because I actually, you know, it, I think it's a beauty that in this day and age, I've... Creative partnerships, deals have come from social. I just think it's such a powerful tool. Uh, so I know a high level about you, but I'm very, very interested to hear more about your story. And, and like I said, I believe we're a reflection of who our businesses are, right? Uh, or our businesses are a reflection of who we really are. So before we get into what you do, what you can provide for the people, because I know that's what you do, you're a people's prison for your community. Take me a step back. Who was Jerome before all, all this that you're doing right now to the, with the community and who is Jerome today? Like, show me the growth transition and then we're going to talk about your shirt. <laughs> so you, you make it sound like I'm doing some things. I'm just out here, man. I'm a corporate America dropout, right? But yeah. I, I got to that point. I was the kid who did everything they told you to do. Go get good grades, get yeah. into a good school, get a good job, and then you'll have a great life. And I got to the top of that ladder and I realized that wasn't true. Right. And so, you know, I grew up the soldier of a stay at home mom and or the son of a stay at home mom and a soldier. And, you know, my dad taught me to work Carolina half days. He'd leave before six, come back after six. And we sit down and have dinner and talk about hard work and diligence and your word being your bond and all of the things that make you a productive citizen in society. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I played sports growing up. I was fortunate enough to play at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University for four mm -hmm. years, got my engineering degree, um, and then just went off into corporate America, man. So, you know, I don't have this hard knock story. I have both my parents at home. We did, we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. And, you know, we just try to make something out of what we had, man, the best we could. Obviously, a lot of humility in the lab, so it's my turn to really put on what I've been seeing, Jerome. So, Jerome, really, why I appreciate you is, uh, you know, and it's so humble for you to say that. But, yes, you, you know, you did take, you know, the route of, you know, doing good by the book, et cetera. But what, what I'm saying is you, you went and studied, uh, you got educated, uh, engineering, like you said. Uh, I see your PMP certified, you got MBA. That's all great, right? But you're now you're doing a little something more than that with that you know, knowledge that you took and your experience, you're going into communities and you're educating real estate education. But on top of, the, in, on top of that, you're not just an educator. You're also a practitioner uh, with value add multifamily investing. I want to talk about it because you use a, a, a terminology uh, where you're, you, I think you call it working force. Is that, is that what you call it? Workforce, right? Work, workforce. Okay. T tell me about that and tell me why you niched into that uh, from a real estate perspective. Then I'm going to tie everything together. Okay. And so, I mean, think about it, right? We got police officers, firefighters, teachers mm -hmm. who are having a hard time finding a quality place to live, right? The people that make the world go round don't have a great place to live. There's, there's a crisis for workforce housing in the U.S. and nobody's paying attention. A lot of people want to focus on the streams. They want to do the really wealthy or they want to do the really poor. But the people in the middle are the ones that usually have the most capacity to go to the highest levels. Yep. I'm the product of that, right? A military uh, enlisted man doesn't make all that much money, right? But because my dad did what he did, I was, I've been able to stand on his shoulders and go do the things that I was able to do. You know, I was the first to go to college, go away and go to college. I was the first to be able to, you know, make $100,000 a year. You know, my dad still doesn't make $100,000 a year. And he runs like a post office since he's gotten out of the military. But it's just like, you know, I've been able to, stand on the shoulders of those folks. And I mean, think about teachers, right? Yeah. You have teachers from the time you're four or five till at least 18, if you finish all the way through high school. Those people are making the hugest impact on our community and what people do and what's acceptable and what's not. Yeah. But they don't have a great place to live. And so, you know, we've taken it upon ourselves to serve that community. Uh, we think that they deserve a great place to live and we want to be the landlords that provide that amazing residence for our residents. 
Okay, so I love that because you're scratching your own itch, and that, that's what I love about a lot of entrepreneurs. They're usually, you know, working within their backyard, right? Something that that they saw was an opportunity or an issue or a problem to solve. So, educate me a little bit. And to those who are listening, uh, we talk about workforce housing. Is that maybe what what maybe some of those are uh, folks are are calling uh, affordable housing, or is that something different? So affordable housing is a tricky term, right? Because there's different mm-hmm. levels of affordable housing and right. the number that you're multiplying against is the person's income, right? Most people qualify their residents based on them making three times what their rent payment will be, right? And so if you want to serve a community where somebody is making $30,000 a year or 36 to make the math easy, that's about 3,000 a month. You know, in essence, when you put in all the utilities and their rent, you know, their housing commitment should be less than a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And so then there's these different degrees of programs. Some programs will go down to 40 percent of the area median income. And so let's say. Uh, for instance, Greensboro, I think the median income is 50 grand. Right. And so if you're doing 40 percent of 50 grand, uh, that puts you at twenty thousand dollars a year. And so now you break that down by month and you get to what a person can actually afford in order where your rents have to be in order for that person to afford it. I don't do that because what we're really, we're looking for the people that are making more money than they can get assistance, but aren't making enough where they can just go get the nice newest and nicest because there's a ton of stock, right? Housing stock in the environment, but you know, people aren't spending the money to renovate them. They're not spending the money to make them nice so that when people come home and, you know, they spend a lot of time at work, but they spend even more time at home, right? And so that environment is extremely important. And so, you know, those are the folks who we really are interested in serving because, you know, that's that's the neighborhood I grew up in, man, right? I mean, you know, my dad was, he ended up being an E8, but when we moved there, he was like an E3 or E4. There wasn't, he wasn't making a pile of money, right? And, you know, it's crazy because a lot of the entry-level soldiers that I, when you look at it, like they're below the poverty line, especially if they have two kids or something like that, like their income is just way too low for them to be able to buy a house or do some of the other stuff. So if you got landlords in who have cognitive dissonance, right? They mm-hmm. they can't see themselves with the people that live there and they're okay with, you know, them living in lackluster communities. Well, yeah. uh, they're not going to make the necessary repairs. They're not going to do the things that are important to invest back in the community. And because that happens, then you start getting crime and people not really taking care of their neighbors and that kind of thing. There's no pride of ownership or pride of where they live. I'm going to get to that in a second because I, I, I love how real estate ties into, you know, obviously a lot of the things that's been going on lately about, you know, change, right? Um, but I want to just take a step back and anchor that point where you talk about, um, you know, first of all, I don't think, you know, the listeners know where you're currently from. You said, that's where I'm from. You know, what kind of, you know, neighborhood and where exactly are you from, currently uh, from on the map and, and where you're investing as well? Yeah. So I live in Greensboro. I live and invest in Greensboro, North Carolina. I had about yeah. 10 or 12 years in Richmond, Virginia, but I grew up in Fayetteville, North Carolina and, you know, Fort Bragg, which is one of the largest army bases in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we had a really mixed community. You know, we had a guy that was a uh, uh, he he worked for a trash company and, you know, he was one of the favorite people in the world. He'd come hanging off the back of the trash truck. He'd grab our trash, put it in and then pull the lever. And that was the part that got me excited at four and five. He'd pull the lever. You see the trash get crushed. You know, I had my own little trash truck. And so I'd come get paper and do the same thing he was doing. And there was one day when I told my mom, hey, I want to be a trash man. Right. And she looked at me in a way only a mom could do. And she said, baby, that's not going to buy you the Nikes and the jeans and all that stuff that you like. Um, you got to get a job that's going to afford you the lifestyle that you want to live. So if you want these nice things, you got to make a lot of money. She said, maybe you could own the trash company, but, you know, just being a trash man isn't a big enough dream for the life that you want to live. And I was like, man, that is that just that was a light shift for me because it's like okay you can't just go do what you enjoy you can't just go do what you like you actually got to figure out how you're going to make money in this um, pursuit of uh, fulfillment in your life through your work and you know it's not a slight for my dad but the reality of the situation is 
like he would leave before I got up and he'd come back at dinner time. And sometimes I had to wait for him. And, you know, I might be a little uh, privileged little kid, right? And like, I'm ready to eat that. Where are you at? Why are you not home yet? Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, being fortunate enough to have my dad come home every day where we could have dinner is something that I didn't really get or really appreciate. But when I compared that with my man Lonnie, who was a trash man, you know, he was home at three o'clock every day, man. Right. So, you know, yeah. he, and, you know, did they make similar money? I don't think so. I'm sure my dad made more money than his. But the fact of the matter was he had that time freedom. You know, when his kids got out of school, they were coming home and he was there to hang out with them. And, you know, part of me wanted that. I, I wanted my dad to have that time freedom. Wow. So I, I'm getting so many gems and you're speaking and I want to time to get in the lab. We're taking notes because I think this stuff, we're not just taking it for bait. I'm like, this is really good stuff. I want to get into it. So you're talking about one thing that I noticed that you said is, um, you know, I think it was Lenny. Is that what his name was? Lenny, Lonnie. Lonnie. Lonnie the trash man. Lonnie. So what's interesting about that is like you saw something and this is why I think it's important, even like you being on the show, you know, someone who looks like us, who, you know, I think it's important to, to show that because what we see is what we're like, okay, this is probably what I want because this is what I've seen. This is, you know, right. And that's what you saw. And then what I think is really interesting is, you know, how your mother, which, you know, at what age uh, did, did you have this conversation? Because I think it's just so important, like the pivotal mind shift. Yeah. So what was that? What age was that? Like four for so then there's that paradigm shift and then there's also what you're seeing your day-to-day -day, you know in the working class and you talk about freedom as well so i'm going to circle all this and tie it to you know really what you're you're wearing right now you, you know you took the red pill and you and you talk about this too about you know you know unplugging you know from the matrix or, or i guess you'd help people exit the matrix do you want to talk about what you mean by taking the red pill because i feel like somehow lonnie the freedom and the working class whole thing is going to tie in together, but I, I could be wrong. I just want to see. Oh, we're going to put a bow on this one for you, brother. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, hopefully your listeners have seen the matrix. If not, it's a yeah. documentary. It's not a sci-fi movie. It's a documentary and they need to go watch it. Right. Yeah. And so what happens is we get in this system where we're doing these things and somebody's dictating to us what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to do it. And the reality of the situation is we were all put on this planet to accomplish a major mission. And too many of us have decided along the way that that mission wasn't important and they trade it for other things. It can be money. It can be prestige of a title. It can be because they feel like they have a family and they can't actually take a risk because they don't know how the mission is going to work out. But the fact of the matter is they all have been placed here with this thing that they're supposed to do. And you just have to have the courage to actually unplug from what people tell you should do. And I, you know, last month made 10 years since I got a haircut, right? And when I was going through that process, people were saying, well, Jerome, you, you, you got to be careful. You're going to mess up your career. I mean, you got a bright future here, but it, if you do certain things, it might impact your ability to continue to progress here. And my thought immediately was, well, what exactly am I getting these haircuts for, right? Uh, am I getting them because it makes me more approachable? Do I look neater? Like, what is it about my coiled hair that is a challenge? And it's like, well, you know, none of the men that are in the positions that you aspire to have hair that's past their shoulders. Okay, well, I'll keep my hair above my shoulders if that's what I need to do in order to be accepted here. But, you know, what, what else? Is there anything else wrong with what I'm doing? Is, and so we kept going down that path. And what I realized is, no, you need to cut it because that's what other people have done and you need to look like other people in order to get to the place that they're in. And then I started to peel the layers. And at that particular company, there was one African-American executive. And then there were two. And then there was one again after the recession. And I thought to myself, wow. Um, so I've got to be the one out of the 17,000 people that work here. Does that make sense? And when I took it even a step further, it's like, it doesn't matter what I do with my hair. I still not going to look like anybody else that I'm going into any of these meetings with. So what difference does it make if my hair is long, short, whether I have hair on my face or don't like none of those things actually matter. What matters is my character and the value that I bring to the table. And all of those things are proven already 
And I'm going to continue to prove them with each assignment that you guys give me. And so I made the decision, hey, here's what I'm going to do. And, you know, I was in a really deep, dark place and I, it was a reset for me anyway. Uh, and so we went down this path and I questioned everything, everything from religion to science. It was just like, all right, why do I believe what I believe? Did, do I believe it or am I just doing it out of tradition and practice because that's what other people did? And when I peeled back all those layers, I realized that the majority of the stuff I didn't believe, I was just doing it because I saw somebody else did it. And so now it's monkey see, monkey do. Wait, let me actually figure out what I truly believe. And there were some Quake books that I read during that period. And I just made this entire transition. And that's when I fully exited from the matrix. It's like, okay, I'm here. I can create my own path. And what happened on the backside of that was I doubled my salary right? I went from being an individual contributor to lead in the organization that I built from uh, two employees to 175, doing $20 million in revenue with 30% profits year over year, all looking the way I looked. And it's like, okay, so what are, what are, where are the real limits? And what is self-imposed versus what is actually true? And for me, I learned that we decide, we put these limits on ourselves trying to uh, govern ourselves or acquiesce in a way that nobody will say anything to us instead of deciding that this is who I am, this is what I'm doing, and I encourage you to accept me as I am. Not in a braggadocious way, not in a dismissive way, but in a I'm doing these things. This is my best self. I'm presenting my best self to you, right? I'm being authentic. I'm being vulnerable. And in doing that, I'm giving you the opportunity to see me in my true essence. And in that true essence, I'm able to deliver on that mission that I was put here to be. And so for me, you know, that ends up being inspirational. That ends up being motivational and transformational for some people who've decided, oh, well, I can't do that. They won't allow that. How do you know? Well, they told me that I got to be twice as good and work uh, twice as hard to get half as much. How do you know? And are you doing your best, right? Or have you decided that you don't even need to try because you can't measure up or it's not going to uh, work out for you the way that you want it to? At the end of the day, I think we've got to view the world from a place that empowers us, that puts us in control and allows us to create, dictate, dominate the space that we're in. Because if we're not doing that, then I think we're wasting everybody's time. I mean, you got to be here and you, you got you to gotta deliver. Because if you're not delivering, somebody's counting on you that you haven't met. And if you don't do your part, then they won't be able to stand on your shoulders and do their part. And that is the greatest tragedy. I mean, Jerome, I'm, I'm loving all the gems. I'm taking them in and, and I'm trying to, it's just, there's so many points that I was just like, oh, I want to go down this, this rabbit hole and, and even build on this conversation because it's just so deep. I knew that when I asked about you, it would be a reflection of your business for this reason. That's why I always ask about you because it shows that, you know, you had, you, you've been awakened, right? And so now I want to ask you the question, do you think, it's that people aren't taking the time to question what you've questioned. Cause I think what you asked, why, I think that's the best answer that we, we, we often start asking when we're young. And then as we get older, we stop and then we just accept things as they are. As so they what is it that, is it the fact that people aren't asking that question and, and we're going to transition to real estate real quick of this is how it must be done. Tell me, what do you think, uh, one should do if they're listening and they, and they want to take the red pill, what should be that first step? Yeah. I mean, I think you got to decide what you believe and why you believe it. Right. Because, you know, if you haven't traveled internationally and actually immerse yourself in the cultures of other nations, then you're missing out on a tremendous opportunity to learn about life. And a perfect example was, you know, riding the ATV through a coffee farm and having a little girl run up to the ATV, 
begging for money. And you can see in her eyes that if she doesn't get the money, she might not eat, right? And we think about all the things that we complain about and how frustrated we are about things that are meaningless. This little girl's trying to figure out how to eat. And she's begging strangers because at the age of eight or 10, she doesn't have anybody providing or caring for her, right? So, you know, I, I think the red pill all comes with, you know, self-awareness, internal mm-hmm. reflection. And it, my, my good friend and coach, James Bryan, calls it the mirror moments, right? And you go and you look in the mirror and you ask yourself, you know, when I get to the end of the road and they got the checklist and it says you're supposed to be this, 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 and this, Am I going to be able to smile and say, yeah, but you forgot about this, this, and this? Are you going to overperform on the breath that you've been blessed with? Or are you just going to struggle through the day, right? We, we want to be survivors, not thrivers. I don't know who taught us that nonsense, right? We, we're here for a reason, and we got to live in the true essence. And so, you know, you, you brought this up, and it's, for me, it's super valuable, and the value of it is this, man. So I'm, I'm this descendant of um, Nigerians. I'm, I'm Yoruba, right? We, 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 my great, great, great grandfather crossed the Atlantic Ocean in the belly of a slave ship, right? Who am I to complain about anything in my experience? Yeah. Who am I, right? Because, I mean, I've never... Unless it was self-imposed, I've never worried about where my next meal was going to come from, right? I, I was able to get a car when I was in high school. Like, all of the luxuries that I have, if I compare it to anything that he had to experience, who am I to complain about any of it? And how, who am I to waste the opportunity that I have not to excel and be excellent and shine a light on our heritage, our culture, our community, so that other people can get the opportunity just in case they're looking for that person like I was looking for when I was in corporate America, right? When you look at the speakers on podcasts, when you look at the speakers at conferences, and we'll go to multifamily right now, right? Where's the diversity? Who's up right. and setting that example for the people who aspire to that? I think you are, Jerome. And that's why we have you in the lab. <laughs> no, but I look, I love the... And, and I'm, I know I'm catching you in the middle of a thought. I just, I don't want this to slip through the cracks. You're talking about gratefulness. And I think this is a really good time. And we're not going to be uh, tone deaf to talk about, you know, pride, being grateful, but then also seeking for more, right? And, and building on that. And I love how you're combining the two uh, in the sense that, you know, this also taps into limiting beliefs where, where, where you know, we're not going to let limiting beliefs get in their way. But it's at the same time, you know, we know what we're worth. And, and the only way you know what you're worth is, I think, what, by looking in the mirror. And I, and I love that. Um, I mean, that's so important. And, and I'm so glad you're, you're bringing this to light. And, and, and um, that's just fascinating, really. So let me, let me dive down because I, I didn't answer your question. And so yeah. for exiting the matrix, for getting your red pill, blue pill moment, you got to yeah. You're Morpheus, right? I think everybody's the superhero of their story. And you've just got to find that guide who's going to present you with the choice of going back to what you've always done or giving you the opportunity to take the red pill and go down the rabbit hole, right? And see how deep it goes and retrain yourself, recalibrate so that you can come back out and manifest that mission that you were placed here for. Because a lot of us, we, you, you talked about the kids and you did it right. We ask why, we dream big, and the world beats us up. Be reasonable, be practical. And the reality of the situation is that's the greatest and fastest way to get to mediocrity. But there's these people out here, these dreamers, these dream catchers who are pursuing it and they're running counterculture and they're telling you to do things that other people won't because it just doesn't seem practical. It doesn't seem reasonable, but who cares? Because you can do it. That's why you're here. That's why it's in your heart. Like they don't put in your heart. They don't put in your mind for it just to stay there. It happens twice. First in your mind, then in the reality. It's, it happens twice, but everybody doesn't have the same thoughts. And so, 
And then you got to be willing to pay the price of admission. That's the last piece, right? So you got these huge dreams. You want to live an extraordinary life. You got to put extraordinary effort into it. Absolutely. That's a fact. So I, we like giving tactical, you know, I like giving tactical advice in the lab, right? Like if I got my notepad, I'm listening to you right now. I'm going to put you on the spot. Like if I'm and we like the youth and, and anybody who's listening, I think we can all reinvent ourselves um, no matter what age, you know, um, what is, what is taking the red pill look like in my current neighborhood, my current situation, who is my Morpheus, right? So what would, what, what would you advise to someone who's listening right now to be like, you know what, is it just waking up in the morning and just really thinking and making it, you know, maybe it's journaling. Is it reaching out to a mentor? And I, and I know I'm talking to the right person because you're tapping into all this. You're building communities, you're building masterminds. I think it's fascinating. We'll talk about that in a second, but what tactical advice would you give to a listener right now to, for them to take their red pill? Yeah, tactical advice. One, read the four agreements. Start there, right? Read the four agreements. And I'm not going to steal the thunder. Just spend the hour reading the book, right? From there, start deconstructing and asking about everything that's foundational. Start with your religious practice. Then move to the lessons you were taught as a child. And then I think the favorite question that I like to ask people when they come into our program is, when did you decide who you were? or who you're going to be? Was it when you were four? Is it when you were eight? Is it when you were 12? Whenever it was, all right? Does that view of the world still put you in power and benefit you so that you can actually perform against that mission that you have, right? And, you know, I think a lot of people decide, hey, I'm going to be this at 12, and then they achieve it, and they're done. Or they realize that, hey, the world's not fair. There's a whole lot of people out there who are bad. And so because of that, I'm not going to try. And they don't ever actually get to that place because they've decided that the world is happening to them instead of for them. And so in those two things, you can get clear. And it's all about clarity. Once you get clarity, then you can go back and say, okay, so this is what I'm working towards. And we're going to reverse engineer it now. I'm working towards this. How can I get there? Do a gap assessment. All right. Done the gap assessment. I'm missing X, Y, and Z. Do I make it or buy it? Do I go outsource this or do I acquire this skill myself, right? You're a podcast host. You either edit your own podcast or you outsource it, right? Plug to investedtalent.com. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that, Jerome. You didn't have to, but thank you. Yeah, right. So you, you do that. And then... From there, you just need somebody to walk the journey with you. And that's the last piece, right? You got your strategy, which you developed from the gap assessment. And now you just got to stay accountable. And you got to be willing to work at it until you manifest the result. A lot of people quit. A lot of people give up. A lot of people say, oh, it's not working. You just got to hammer that nail until you get it in. And a lot of people, because we live in this microwave society, they don't understand the crock pot mentality. Sometimes it just takes time. You just have to have enough time in the seat for that thing to actually come to fruition. That's so important, that last one, just because, and we can talk about this from a real estate lens to the, the compound effect. And we have this issue with instant gratification. Even when we see, you know, a Jerome and, and we see the event, uh, we don't see the process. Uh, I think it's important. And I think we can tie this back down to, you know, your process and, and growing over time. Um, I, I, I do want to touch on, I think it's just refreshing. And I want to hear what your thoughts are on this. When you asked, and, and I was thinking about this for myself, and I hope if you're listening, you probably were too, is, you know, when you asked, you know, when did you decide who you were going to be? Do you believe that one can reinvent themselves over time? Because, you know, you know I, I, let me ask that. And I'm just going to pause right there. Short answer is yes, right? Yeah. When you decide who you're going to be, right? If you decided at 12 and that's not who you want to be anymore, well, you got a great opportunity to decide who you're going to be today, right? But the difference is it's not just talk, right? Your actions have to line up with that, right? It's be, do, have. So you, you have to be it. Mm-hmm. Then you do the things necessary to confirm your belief in you being. And then you have the result of what that is. You don't not, you're not wealthy because you haven't become the person you need to be in order to have that wealth. But when you become that person, then you do the work, then you will have the wealth. 
it's just like knocking, right? And there's a scripture in the Bible that talks, knock and it should be op- open unto you, seek and ye shall find. Like you actually have to do the work, but you have to do the work after you do it internally and see it in your mind. Like people skip that part. They either skip seeing it in your mind or they skip the work and they just want to get to the end result. I think we spend a whole lot of time emulating what the back end of what a successful person does instead of all of the stuff that you didn't see before they got there. Right. Mm, I love that. You, you must have read, have you read the millionaire fast lane? I have not. Okay. This is your book, man. This is, I, I'm going to take the four agreements and you're going to take the, the millionaire fast lane. Let's because, do it. Because I think it's literally you're, you're speaking his language. MJ DeMarco, you guys check it out. We're going to, we're going to uh, transition into the keeping it real segment. Um, listen, I, I'm curious to hear this because, you know, you're kind of in the space that I'm in being a practitioner and at the same time helping people. Right. And well, let me preface by saying you're always helping people. So which one do you like both? You're either helping people with boots on the ground, your entire team, your company, or you're helping people. It sounds like at a group level too, or individually, but on the education point, which one do you feel pulls you, pull, you're more drawn to? And, and is there a reason why? Yeah, man, I'm a practitioner, right? Yeah. I'm a practitioner. I, I met a monk uh, last fall mm-hmm. and he said, look, man, I, I'm not a teacher. I'm not your guru. I'm a practitioner. And if you want to learn how to be a practitioner, then you can come watch me practice. And I was like, ooh, mm-hmm. I'm touching my soul with this one. And the reality of the situation is like, there's a lot of educators, right? And the educators probably make more money through education than they do running their business which is fine if that's your model. But, you know, I I want to be the guy that actually finds the gold. I don't want to be the guy that sells the picks, right? Because I don't want to go tell people, hey, there's gold out there. Here's a pick. And I'm just the kind, I'm in the middle of it. No, I found gold. I'm going to teach you how to find gold. And, you know, this is one of my issues with the industry. Yes, yes. Educators, right? Who are saying there's gold out there, give me 25, 30, 35, $50,000, and I'll show you how to do it. Well, the majority of people that go through those courses don't ever find any gold, mm-hmm. right? And for the people who come from a background like me, it always comes back, right? They're trying to do something to create generational wealth for their family because they've heard about it, but they don't know how to do it and they don't have a example for it they go into debt and now they have this used Mercedes or BMW that they were trying to use for real estate education, but nothing to show for it except frustration and heartache. And so I I wanted to tear down those barriers because if I go back to the way that I got in a multifamily, which was sitting on the stoop of one of my fix and flip properties and somebody coming and ask me if I knew anything about it. And I have to recount the story that, Hey, I tried to buy that four or five months ago and the banks went and lent to me because I didn't have the right experience. And I didn't know who to call because I didn't know anybody that owned any of these buildings. And please don't leave me out because it's what I've been wanting to do for the past seven months. And him saying, well, how much money you're going to bring and saying, well, we'll work something out. Just don't leave me out of the deal because I can bring some value. And he went and made that offer anyway. He wasn't successful in getting it under contract. And this is how it works. So a partner of mine who I've been lending money to over the years because he was a rehabber, he reached out to him and said, hey, I want you to come be the contractor on this deal. I'm putting a team together. And he said, wait, Jerome asked me about that deal back in January. I'm only doing it if he does it. And that's how I got in the deal, right? That's how I got back in the deal. Seeds that I planted back in the winter came up in the summer, right? And, you know, I got that deal. I was in the seat of asset manager, still am, and, you know, went to the paper. And now my name was in the paper for closing a deal. Guess who started calling me? The banks. They wanted to lend to me now because I closed the deal. And so we took those relationships and we started doing our own contracts and running our own properties from there. Right. But, you know, for the people who are getting into the space, I don't want to tell you to go hunt Moby Dick, because if you look at any of the education educators track records, none of them did that. Not a single one. They went and they bought smaller properties, 500 to $1.5 million. 
bought those properties, bought another one, got some track record, got some momentum. And then from there, they moved up to the bigger properties. Mm -hmm. But they're telling you, hey, go big or go home. Mm -hmm. We've heard it. You're competing with people from all over the country for a very, very small amount of properties when there's a bunch of other properties that, hey, you can buy, start your track record, get some experience in the space. And then when the brokers um, are talking to you and the banks are talking to you, you can answer that question with confidence. Hey, I've got this 20 unit over here. We just repositioned it. We took rents from 500 to 685. We renovated however many units over the course of the past 18 months. They can't say, oh, well, wow. So you actually do have experience. Well, yeah, and we're looking to scale. So now we're looking for bigger properties. What do you have? It's a totally different conversation than, hey, I'm connected to a group of investors from all over the country who are looking to buy these value-add properties that are over 100 units. What have you done? Nothing. I bought a single-family home, maybe, and I don't have any business experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's really important, and and this is, I mean, you touched on such good points. One is the paradox of practice, right? Uh, there's, I the reason why I say you know the book that I even recommended you is um, any book that I read, I ask you know I look at the author. Is the author a did he or she sell books, you know, to get themselves in that position, or did they practice then write a book? If it's the other way around, I don't read it. If it's a practitioner, it's the latter then I read it, right? It's the same thing with advice. Same thing with, you know, what you're talking about is, and, and that's really important. The second part is, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I know people have their own agendas and that's why it's, you know, they should be careful of where they're getting their information from or why they think a certain way, going back to your point, asking the why, was I influenced? Was I being marketed to, to someone else's benefit to be a part of what they're doing to go big, go big. But since you can't go big, go with me, you know, right? <laughs> you know, so, and we know, we know who we're talking about and what, what we're talking about, but that's the, neither here nor there. What I want to focus on is you, is, is, you know, that's very, it's very interesting in how you're able to kind of form that bridge of, you know, becoming a practitioner and building a foundation and building on top of that. So why don't we fast forward a bit? You talked to me about, it sounds like your first deal. Uh, it's, you know, and then we were talking multifamily here. Um, you got in as an asset manager, you know, what did that next conversation look like or the next conversation you were having with a lender or maybe a broker look like, which, which one, which one came, uh, what was the next step? Oh uh, yeah. I, um, direct mail to owners in Greensboro, North Carolina. And, you know, I got, uh, what was his name? Rob was his son, Lee, got Lee on the line and said, Lee, I'm looking to buy that building that you own. And let me take a step back, Jerome. I'm sorry to cut you off. You, 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 you're an asset manager, and then the, your next step is I'm going to direct mail. Why that transition? Like, where did you get this information from, and why did you think that was the next best step? Oh, baby. Um, so I think every investor is dealing with four challenges. Knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital, right? So not only was I asset manager, but I mean, I was a, a part of the owner, right? We did a joint venture on that deal. So the asset manager just got me in the press release that being formally in that role was what got me the notoriety uh, in the media. So, um, you know, I, 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 again, was connected to fix and flippers, right? And that's how they got their deals. They either got it from wholesalers or they were marketing directly to owners. I was like, well, it works over here. Why won't it work over here? Mm. Right. And so we took that process that people were using in fix and flip and single family and applied against multifamily. We sent out about 300 pieces, got a few calls back and, you know, we got a live one on the hook. And so Lee and I met at a property that he'd owned for about 20 years and he was ready to get out of the business. And the property was transitioning and struggling a little bit. And we went in and, we weren't scared of the construction. We weren't scared of the demo. And, you know, we were able to get that thing under contract for a reasonable number. And to give people some context of, of the type of properties you're talking about. So the first one, you're a partner on a deal. How large was that? Or not that the size matters, but I'm just to give people context. And then what was the next one uh, after that? Yeah. So we've done a, we did a 23 that was in Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. townhome style building. And then this next one was a 20 and we also bought an eight unit from him in that same, on the same day in that transaction. So oh. um, yeah, man, I mean, you know, nothing super big, you know, we bought it for eight forty. Um, nice. 
and leveraged it with the 80 percent loan and then we went to work on renovating the units and you know that first property we did a heavy value add and when i say heavy i mean we did roof siding uh first floor half bath and laundry room taking walls out to open up the concept um you know tile uh granite like we touched every surface new parking lot landscape and all of that wow. stuff. that's a real good way to get your hands dirty on the first on the first <laughs> or second one that's uh that one was pretty intense. And so then the next one, you know, we're doing light stuff, lighter stuff, you know, cosmetic. Cosmetic, right. Inside, right. But, you know, we got through that. We're basically all the way through that, looking to refi it out, coming up on two years of ownership on that one, already refi the first one. And so, you know, the, the game for us is really just come in, force the appreciation through improving the operations. That could be reducing expenses. That's increasing income and just creating that spread for the net operating income. We do those two things. And then from there, you know, we're able to go back and execute that Burr method, right? Buy rehab, uh, rent. Yeah. Re- Refinance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of R's, but. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's an extra one in there for Ruben too. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. No. And so, you know, we're just executing that strategy over and over again. And then, you know, if somebody really wants it, we'll sell it. But, you know, we're in this game for cash flow, right? Yeah. We're playing yeah. a balance sheet game. We're not playing the uh, do a transaction game. It pays bigger short term, but long range, you can't build that tsunami. Mm. Mm. I love that. So uh, one thing I really want to anchor is that you, that you keep mentioning is, you know, you talk about having the exposure and, and you getting your foot in the door. Um, I had partners tell me this were a little bit ahead of the game. They were GPs on a deal uh, and they were saying how from a lender perspective, there's more credibility. Um, and, and is that, is that true rather than let's say a limited partner, because I guess you're, you're more, I guess on the, on the front lines is, is that, is that true? Or is that what you mean also by being kind of like in the, in the, in the limelight of what lenders see as a credible uh, future, uh, I guess, potential client of theirs? Yeah, so you get zero credibility for being a limited partner, right? Mm-hmm. You're just along for the ride. And the way I describe this in the syndication, mm-hmm. right? You got, you're, you're at the airport. You're coming in, you're giving the lady your ticket. She scans it. You go down the walkway. You got the stewards and steward is greeting you. You wave at the pilot. You wave at the co-pilot and you go take your seat. And then they get <laughs> point A to point B. That's what limited partners are. The general partners are everybody that's responsible for getting you there, including the guy on the ground that's putting the baggage on the plane. But we do joint ventures, right? We're fighter jet pilots. Everybody's got a job. Okay, I like that. Or something. And in that, when you go talk to the bank, now you can talk about, hey, you know, I'm in a joint venture that owns this deal. Here's what we've been able to do from a result standpoint. And the only question that they're going to ask you is, did you sign the loan? If you sign the loan, then... Oh, yeah. Well, we can do that. But yeah. On the note, yeah. Uh, well, we're not sh- quite sure that you have the experience you need. You got anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I want to bring that to light. That's so important to be on the document. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, you need to be on that piece of paper because uh, then they're talking to, you know, the drivers, which is you. So, so that's fantastic. Um, uh, and I really like how you're bringing that to life. So, so interesting. So transitioning to today, is it still the same model or how did we transition into, you know what, workforce housing? Was that the same idea or is that kind of like a niche where you're like, you know what, we're just, let's target these areas where people are, or is it just so matter of fact, maybe it's kind of, maybe it's both. Which one was it? No, this is our game, man. We, we mm-hmm. want to be in that niche, workforce housing mm-hmm. in North Carolina and Virginia. Um, and really exclusively in North Carolina now, I think we found a little pocket that we can own. And so we want to own a thousand doors in this market by 2028. Nice. I love it. That's what's up. I love that. Um, tell us about, uh, I think, you know, we talked about uh, one of the things I went through. I like going through my, my uh, guests content and, and I thought you had a, a really interesting, um, by the way, people got to check it out. I'll have the links in the show notes. Uh, you, you do a great kind of breakdown of checklist, et cetera. Um, you talk about, there's a lot of bad advice out there. Uh, what's one that you think, you know, in your position with the experience that you have um, that comes to mind first, that makes your blood boil. Uh, and this is real estate related, maybe a big misconception. Put your money in my deal as a limited partner 
and you'll get experience that you need in order to run your own deal. Yeah. If you want to be an operator, locking up your money for the next five to 10 years is the worst thing you can do because you can't go do your own deal now because you don't have any pursuit money right? You're not getting any experience other than getting some reports by being a limited partner. The way that you get experience so that you can go do your own deals and be a lead is by joining a GP, period. And whether it's as a joint venture or part of the GP for the syndication, but that's the only way that you're getting experience because you're not getting underwritten. And if you're doing a bankable deal, that's the way we do our deals. If you haven't done a loan, you don't have the experience you need in order to do a deal. So putting your money in somebody else's deal when you have a desire to go do your own deals is not the way to get experience. But people will tell you that all the time. No, oh, because they have their own agendas to fill, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so I love how you're, you're, you keep on harping on this, and it's great because I think you're, you're bringing a point home here. Um, how do I get your attention, Jerome? You know, you're in, out in the field. I'm a newbie. How do I come out here? You know, if I'm listening and you're, you might be driving, if you're watching it, you know, how do I get the man with the shirt that says I took the red pill? How do I get his attention and how can I add value to you? Yeah. So long range, I don't know if you don't have the basis, right? The foundation, we talked about the four, right? Knowledge, yeah. deal flow, mm -hmm. experience, capital. capital. If you don't have knowledge, mm -hmm. I can't help you other than to say, hey, take our 11 week course that's going to walk you end to end on how to do a joint venture deal. Because if you can't talk the language, then nobody's going to take you credibly anyway, right? And then we move up to the next run. Everybody that's in this space is looking for deals. You have the knowledge, now you can evaluate the leads to see if you have found some deals. Letters are the same, very different things. Leads and deals are not the same thing, even though people think they are. And what I will tell you is you need that knowledge. And it does me no good for you to bring me a bunch of leads, right? Bring me a deal. Then we can reward you for finding the deal and bring you into the fold with us, even if you don't have experience, because you don't. Even if you don't have a ton of capital, because you probably don't. But you can get rewarded with some ownership for doing the hard work of finding the deal. If you've got capital or you have a network that has capital, then there's an opportunity for you to co-GP that way. But you still need the knowledge. Everybody wants to skip the knowledge. Nobody wants to actually get educated. Because it takes time, right? Process, process, process. People want event. It takes time, but I did it this dumb way, right? It was the most inefficient, ineffective way. I Tell listen, us. I listen to 40 hours of podcasts every week. I still do. What would you do differently today, knowing what you know? Of course, right? I need somebody to curate the content for me so I'm not spending 40 hours to get an four hours of good knowledge out, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was confused. I was listening to every educator out there trying to figure out how their systems mesh with what I had, right? I was trying to execute their strategies in my game, and they didn't always agree. Just like I don't agree with most of the big guys out there right now, right? Because I'm telling you, if you're a new investor, I want you to go do a deal that's between $500 and $1.5 million first. Mm -hmm. I want you to get a quick win. Once you get that done, get it stabilized, get your experience with the reposition, then I want you to go do a bigger deal or go do another deal the same size if you want to get some more experience that way. But work your way up. Stop going to go get Moby Dick from the beginning and get some tuna in the boat. Learn how to eat off the tuna and then go get some shark, some swordfish, right? And, <laughs> yeah, and get you a well if you want to. But uh -huh. the reality of the situation is for every 200 buildings that are in, 200 unit apartment buildings that are there in a city, there's probably 10 times that as stuff that's 100 units or smaller that people from all over the country aren't chasing. Yeah, there's a gray area. There's a gap. You got a strategic advantage. If you're the one playing in that space, are they harder to run? Yep. Is it going to be more difficult to make money? Yeah. But if you figure that out, imagine being able to take that skill set and go big. 
Yeah. Can you, let's talk about that for a second um, real quick as we transition towards the end. What are some of the nuances? Because uh, I know people advertise this stuff differently and we're hearing a lot to talk about the real stuff, right? Uh, what are some of the challenges that you might come across when you are playing in, in, in a range where the big black stones of the world, they're not, they're not looking at that. That's too too small for them. They wouldn't even glance at it, which is an advantage for us. And then the, you know, the, most of the investors who are maybe in the duplex strapless quads, they mean they're afraid to take that next leap. So then there is an opportunity, but with that small gap of opportunity, uh, what are some of the challenges that you face maybe in the 20, 30, 40, 50 unit uh, range um, that you, that you, that jumps out at you, that you know are things that people will stumble upon. You don't have on-site management, right? And so the big, is it all self-managed Jerome? No, we use third-party property management, right? But the big, bad property management companies with the best branding don't want that, right? They want to put a person there so they can charge payroll and then charge you their commission on top of it for organizing everything. Uh, And so that is the biggest one. And the property manager is critical to the execution of your business plan. You got to partner with the right property management company. How do I know? Because I did it the wrong way the first time. Right. But when you get somebody who specializes in this asset class, they can make your world amazing. And when you say they, I want to make sure we don't confuse that. You're saying the property manager has experience working in that specific asset class. You're not taking a chance with someone who's going to figure it out. Is that what you meant? You do not want somebody to figure it out with Mm -hmm. your property. That is not what you want. You, (laughs) You want somebody who already does this successfully, especially if you're new. Right. Because you don't know what questions to ask. You're expecting them to guide you along the way. And a lot of property managers only want you to report on the back end, right? They don't want to have those conversations along the way. Uh, Can you, can you elaborate on that drum? I'm not not familiar with what you mean by that. So you'll get your monthly reports from the property manager and you don't know if you're going to make any money till the end, till the 10th or the 15th of the next month. Right. So reports just came out for May. Oh, in every year you mean? Okay. You know, I, I got those last week. And so the reporting, like we have conversations, for instance, like as soon as I hang up with you, I'm on the call with the property manager to have our weekly conversation about what's happening. If you're not talking to them regularly, you have no idea what's going on. They'll just send you a report at the end with some pictures and say, here you go. Right. And so if you're counting on that money to pay your mortgage or to pay some other expenses or to pay the people that own the deal, you're surprised. Excellent. And I know uh, we're, we're wrapping up here, so let's wrap up. Um, we're headed towards the top of the hour. Real quick, fire round. I want to hear. You got so much knowledge behind you. Tell me, quick, real quick, favorite book. Ooh-wee. So I'm going to be selfish here, right? I, I, I recently released a book called Your Dream Should Be Real. Nice. Uh, it's that. available. And it for anybody who's trying to figure out how to exit a matrix, I walk you through the process in that book. I love that. We'll definitely be including that below. Um, the best habit that serves you every day, Jerome? I've committed to six miles a day. Rain, snow, sleet, sunshine. And recently it's been a run instead of walking. <laughs> six miles a day? Respect. I love that. Best tool that helps you, helps you excel throughout your day? Meditation, right? So at the beginning of the day, I will set the intention for the day. And then through that consolidation of thought and being deliberate and having intentional action, I'm able to have a great and exciting day. Love that. If you could describe a successful investor in one word, what would that word be? Consistent, right? Consistent is the difference. Love that. Well, love that. What question you wish I would have asked you, Jerome? This was more than real. Talk to me, brother. What did I miss? What's your thesis on life? Ooh, I, I, you want to shoot another podcast for that? Come on, you're going to get me in trouble. You're going to run for your t- <laughs> We could go down. No, I, you know what? And I'm looking forward, uh, my friend, to, to build on, 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 that, uh, on those type of questions. Uh, what is your thesis real quick in, a, in a one, one liner, what, if you were to describe it? Your dream should be real. That's real. That's real. Listen, Jerome, man, thanks, thanks for keeping it so real. Uh, before we drop off, you talked about your new book. Um, also, you're doing so much in the community uh, as a practitioner, and also you're helping people tap into uh, getting their red pill. 
Um, where can listeners find out more about what you're doing and maybe how, you know, they can work with you? Yeah. I mean, if they're interested in real estate education, hit our platform, MyersMethods.com, M-Y-E-R-S-M-E-T-H-O-D-S.com. Get a free four-step guide on getting started in multifamily. And it'll tell you why we like joint ventures over syndications. And then if you want to connect with me one-on-one, I'm on LinkedIn every day, man. So yeah, I love it. I've been watching your stuff. Greensboro, North Carolina. Find me on LinkedIn. We will do. And just like that, Jerome, we are out.